to the 16th edition of the Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by Detol Baninga Swast India at Darbar Hall. We are delighted to introduce Democracy, the Warp and the Weft with Rona Joy Sain, Yamani Ayer, Mokilika Banerjee in conversation with Seema Sarohi. As fault lines emerge within democracies across the world, an engaged panel examines the crisis at its roots through fundamentals of our democratic practices stand for the challenge they bring forth. Together, they discuss the political and electoral process, the paradox of democracy and its triumphs and discontents. Please welcome on stage Rana Joyce Sain, Rana Joyce Sain is a Senior Research Fellow at the Institute of South Asian Studies and South Asian Studies Program, National University of Singapore. His most recent book is House of the People, Parliament and the Making of Indian Democracy. Sain has worked for over a decade with leading Indian newspapers, most recently as an editor with the Times of India. Yamani Ayer is the president and chief executive of the Center for Policy Research. Her research interests span the fields of public finance, social policy, state capacity, governance, and the study of contemporary politics in India. Ayer has published widely in academic publications and the popular press and writes regularly on current affairs and policy matters in mainstream Indian newspapers. Mokulika Banerjee is a professor at LSE and was the inaugural director of the LSE South Asia Center from 2015 to 2020. She has published extensively on Indian democracy and her latest book, Cultivating Democracy, Politics, and Citizenship in Agrarian India, was published by Oxford University Press, New York, in 2021. Seema Sarohi is a Washington, D.C.-based columnist for the Economic Times and an analyst for the Observer Research Foundation. She writes on foreign policy and has covered India-US relations for more than three decades. Her latest book is titled Friends with Benefit, the India-US Story. Over to the panel. Um, hello, everyone. A very good morning and a big welcome uh, to this discussion which uh, on a topic that we all are thinking about across the world. Uh, different strains uh, are coming into democratic polities, and that's what we're going to examine now. We have academic uh, Mukulika Banerjee, who's written a book, Cultivating Democracy. So first, I would ask Mukulika to describe for us, in short, what the book is about, so we are all familiar with it. <laughs> Thank you, Seema. And, uh, good morning to everyone. It's lovely to be at the first session straight after the inaugural uh, at this incredible literature festival. Um, I'm going to make three points about my book uh, because this is a very, very short summary and we'll have time to come back and forth. We all are very familiar with each other's work, uh, so hope we'll have a conversation that'll be interesting for you. The first thing I want to say about the book, Cultivating Democracy, is that I've studied Indian democracy for over 20 years from a village in West Bengal, in rural India. And the first thing to say is when we think about Indian democracy, we need to remember that India is a sovereign democratic republic. Now we write about Indian democracy, talk about Indian democracy, we do much less thinking about India's republic. And my argument is that Without the values of the republic, there is no democracy, right? So in India's case, the republic is not just a question of uh, a lack of monarchy. Yes, it is rule of the people, people are sovereign. But the word republic, which Ambedkar was very keen on 
retaining and using to describe Indian uh, democracy is absolutely key. And I think both in academic and popular literature, we need to think about it more. The second point is, why do we think about it? So what does the word republic do next to democracy? Democracy in this case, in the way India is described, is really about political democracy. It is about how the relationship between the citizen and their representatives are defined. It's a vertical relationship. So there are elections, there's parliament, there is representation of different kinds. It is a politics of competition. But the word republic is about horizontal relations between citizens. It's what Ambedkar was so wedded to that concept of fraternity, where you create solidarity, where you create bonds of attachment to people you're not uh, related to or belong to in any other way. But the work of politics, So this horizontal, this vertical and horizontal uh, democracy and republic are important ways. And the, I think the shorthand way in which this is described in our language, in our academic language, is that vertical relationship is institutional democracy. It's political democracy. It's what Ronald Jai will talk about. It's about parliament. But the republic, horizontal uh, uh, relationship, is what Ambedkar certainly was calling social and economic democracy. It's about relationships between people. And of course, in the Indian case, our biggest challenge is caste. The third and final point is the title of the book, Cultivating Democracy, is deliberately a play on the word and on the act of cultivation. Uh, it does two things. One is it makes the simple point that democracy is not something that you can just impose from top and expect it to happen. It is not just an institutional framework that you introduce. You've got to create democratic culture. So the work of the republic has to happen in order to have a, a democracy. And that work is cultivation. You've got to cultivate democracy on a daily basis, every minute, every uh, uh, place that you're in. The second meaning of the word is this, this uh, my understanding of democracy, my theorization of democracy is coming from rural India, a place we don't see as a place that creates political theory. We always think there are recipients of political theory. But when you're an, a farmer, a cultivator, you know what cultivation is about. So you can think about cultivation deeply, and that informs how you act democratically. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mughalika. Uh, Ranjjoy, could you tell us uh, what your book is about and how, in short, how the parliament has evolved over the years? Um, and so that, you know, whether it's really the people's voice. Right. Uh, thanks, Seema. Uh, so my book, very briefly, uh, you know, begins with the premise that uh, institutions in general are understudied in India. It's, you know, the elections are, of course, a big festival of democracy and, uh, you know, much of the focus, both academic and popular, is on, on, on the elections. So in, in some senses, this book acts as a corrective to, to that uh, trend. Uh, uh, and very quickly, you know, the book is, is, is a sort of an institutional history. Uh, uh, although it's not chronological, and it looks at parliament through different prisms, including, you know, for instance, the changing composition of parliament, uh, the, the, the issue of disruptions, which is often seen as a defining feature of uh, Indian parliament, as well as elsewhere. I look, look at it through the prism of corruption, uh, because, you know, politicians and corruptions, unfortunately, you know, sort of are synonymous uh, in India. Um, I also look at the, the this, uh, committee system, which is, uh, again, one of the aspects of parliament which is, which is understudied. Uh, to your second question on, you know, how, uh, you know, parliament has evolved uh, very quickly, and um, we can come back to that again. Um, I think in terms of the composition of parliament, you know, uh, there's been dramatic changes. For instance, to, uh, you know, to give one example, uh, the, the early parliaments, you know, the first two parliaments, 52 and 57, were dominated by lawyers, you know, almost, if I'm not wrong, if I get, remember the numbers correctly, almost a third 
of the, of the uh, parliamentarians who are lawyers. That has now changed dramatically. You know, lawyers are uh, probably around five percent of the current, uh, you know, of the current uh, house. You have more people, you know, more uh, people from you know, who term themselves agriculturalists, although that is a somewhat of a fuzzy term. Uh, we also have many more, uh, you know, people who classify them, classify themselves as business persons. So I think there's been a dramatic change uh, in, in, in the composition of parliament and that also has, you know, uh, uh, affected or impacted the way parliament has functioned. And the change hopefully has made, made it uh, like a better representatives, uh, you know, a better composition and a more equitable, uh, would you say? You know, so it has become more representational, but there are serious uh, representational deficits too. So, uh, for instance, you know, women, and you know, uh, both Yamini and Mukuli can talk more about that, is uh, that seriously underrepresented. I think this current parliament has the highest ever number of women, which is, if I'm not wrong, around 13 or 14 percent, which is in fact far lower than the global average, but also much lower than our neighbors, you know, Bangladesh and Pakistan, partly because they have instituted, you know, reservation or quotas for women, which India has not been in, been able to. So there are these uh, representational deficits. Again, if you look at minorities, uh, you know, the current parliament, the representation of Muslims is the lowest ever. Uh, so you know, it's 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 rarely ever sort of uh, you know be, uh, match the 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 number of say Muslims in in, in India during the Indira Gandhi years. It um, it had sort of roughly was was, um, you know, uh, at a par. Currently, you know, it, it's far below, you know, what the population of Muslims. So, so there are serious representational deficits along with, you know, uh, an expansion of representation in right. Parliament. Which I think uh, we should go to Yamini to get her comments on uh, the current trends in India's democracy. As Rana Joy said, this parliament has the lowest number of uh, uh, Muslim representatives, uh, what does that say? Um, and how, how does it gel with uh, worldwide uh, trends? Thank you. Thanks, Seema. Um, let me try and answer that question by trying to bring together both uh, uh, Mokulika and Rananjoy's uh, framework on, on how to think about Indian democracy, um, both its evolution and the present moment. And I think there are two important threads that emerge out of this. Um, on the one hand, India's electoral success that we have had successive elections, uh, there were moments when, uh, uh, particularly uh, in the dark days of booth capturing, when the process of elections itself were complex uh, and shrouded in color. But despite all of that, with very few uh, hard moments of disruption, we have had a, a remarkable success at ensuring that the fundamental core of what makes for a democracy, uh, free elections and to a degree fair elections, um, have actually evolved and strengthened if you look at voter participation, if you look at participation of women in the electoral process. And alongside with that, the presence of democratic institutions, they exist. Uh, with watts, as Ronan Joy just described, they, they, but, they, but they do exist. Uh, and, and we take, uh, as a society, deep pride in these institutions and deep pride in these processes. And that, to me, speaks to the larger question of democracy, because democracy is not just about the act of elections or the presence of these institutions. It is about how they embed a set of norms in society. And I think if you look back to the founding moment as India adopted uh, the framework of liberal democracy in the constitution, there was a hope that the elite political process would in some ways lead the charge to deepening the roots of liberal democratic norms in Indian society. And I think what I learned from Mukulika's work uh, is in fact, and if you bridge that back with a lot of what Ronan Joy has been talking about as well, uh, um, the, the honest truth is that Indian political elites have done very little 
to save, uh, to cultivate democracy, to borrow from Mukuleka, uh, to build uh, that democratic culture. It is the masses, rather surprisingly, for how political theorists used to think about democracy, and I think how even our founding fathers thought about democracy uh, uh, in our founding moment. It is the masses who have owned democracy and who have sought hard to find ways of cultivating that substantive democracy. It's been limited, there is no argument there, but the process through which People have come to the fore, both to vote, and as Mukulika works, Mukulika's work shows us very evocatively, even that process itself has been about building a democratic culture, building an understanding and imagination of what we expect of our representatives. Through modes of civic action, limited, no doubt, but they have existed through the course of our history, all the way even to the present moment. Those modes of civic action have tried to inculcate core cultures of democracy in our citizenry. What are those cultures? a deep public awareness of the impact of issues. So we take to the streets, even in dark moments of democracy, we take to the streets. And, the, and, and in fact, we have taken even the strongest governments down to the knees by taking to the streets. Uh, the idea of expressing and articulating citizenship, which is fundamentally in a democratic context about placing claims of accountability on the state. It is through civic action that the state was forced to have a right to information. The state was forced to build at least some semblance of a welfare architecture for the people, even as elites uh, were pushing for a very different kind of imagination of the Indian economy. So I think these are some of the deep successes of how both the representational institutions and the representational process of, of electoral democracy created a space for the cultivation of democracy that I think in our conversations, even in this contemporary moment about democracy, we tend to forget and we need to bring them to the fore because ultimately the global answers to the challenge of democracy, we're using different terms to try and explain where we are. We say authoritarianism, we say populism, we say majoritarianism, and it's not just an Indian phenomenon, it is a global phenomenon. Um, and we do see certain kinds of common threads through uh, these types of democratic uh, 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 electoral uh, responses, but the answers will only lie in really seeing how best we can cultivate, cultivate that substantive moment. And here I just want to make one important comment about the present moment and then I'll stop, which is there's been a lot of debate and discussion, much of which I agree with, about the challenges to our representational institutions, uh, uh, the nature of our elections, what Rananjay was saying about how parliament functions. In fact, frankly, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't necessarily represent all of India, uh, the nature of our political discourse, the presence of crony capital, money in politics, all of these, the authoritarian tendencies of our institutions not to put checks and balances. But to me, both the opportunity and the challenge to democracy lies in the fact that if you look at India in the last three to four years, most of the citizen activism, the, the, the substantive cry for deeper representation and demand for accountability has come from steering far away from the formal party political space. So what I see in Indian democracy today is a complete di uh, a, a sort of a, a, di a, a dichotomy or a separation between what the formal representative arm of democracy is doing and how power is being exercised there and what that does to our, our ability to function as democratic citizens, and citizens completely losing faith and trust in the ability of that representative system to respond to their aspirations, their anxieties, and their perspectives. So we take to the streets, yes, in a limited way, but how do we bridge that gap? The answer to our democratic challenge will only come from that. Right, I can't uh, but uh, think of the United States where democracy has come under strain uh, recently, where there was an attack on um, Capitol Hill where uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate sit. So, uh, and there's such a deep polarization in the United States. There, the people, if I were to extrapolate uh, from what you're saying, the people who supported Donald Trump are uh, sort of a certain of certain ilk. They uh, they're very right wing in a way. They're anti immigrant. They, uh, some would say they're xenophobic, etc. So democracy uh, has come under strain there as well. And the fifty fifty div uh, divide uh, in the U.S. It's so interesting that uh, when the House of Representatives held a hearing on the uh, 
January 6th attack, it hardly made any impact on the elections. You know, it just, people voted the way they were going to vote before. So it was very interesting to me. Um, anyway, going, coming back to Mukulika, what do you think uh, about these global trends and how best one can uh, sort of counter them, uh, especially the threats to democracy? Okay. So, you know, I live in Britain. I teach at LSE, so I live in London, and I follow British politics as closely as I follow Indian politics. And I'm sure there's everyone in this room is probably aware of what a circus uh, British politics has been for the last couple of years. And yet, following it and following the events in the US, one cannot be struck by two things. One is the strength of institutions, of them holding, the fact that there were police officers who managed to stop and mislead. You remember that very clever police officer who misled the crowd down the wrong corridor saying, because they didn't know where it was. There are incredible acts of bravery, but also somewhere it was possible to push back because there was a sense of institutions, there are trials, there are investigations, and these are carried out. In Britain too, you see that there are parliamentary standing committees continue to do their work. Yes, there is crony capitalism. During COVID, it was rampant corruption. People were getting friends of the prime minister, were getting contracts. But the standing committees are holding each of those MPs and ministers to account on a daily basis. Alongside that, as we know, there is no British prime minister who can call himself the British prime minister or herself without facing the press on a daily basis. Right? I wake up every morning to the Today program on BBC where brutal questioning happens to the prime minister and all of the cabinet. This is what democratic practice is about, where you need a press, as Yamini was saying, accountability is so important, and that's what the media is there for, to hold elected representatives uh, uh, accountable. The third thing is, just briefly on this democratic backsliding uh, globally, <clears throat> for me, the US story really is about what happened between Capitol Hill and the midterm elections in November 21. The fact that there wasn't a red wave was, and the fact that Trump has lost huge amounts of credibility for not having created that red wave and a Republican win is precisely because of what I was talking about as Republican values, what is called active citizenship, the work that happens between elections. You're not just campaigning to win, you're, camp you're working on the ground making sure people have voter IDs, the fact that they know the issues, the fact that they're unafraid to come out and vote, all of that hard work. If you listen to Obama's speech when Biden won, he says precisely this. He quotes John Lewis, this uh, civil rights activist who just died recently before that, saying the hard work of democracy really happens in between elections. So that's, you know, and that's the sort of popular mobilization and what happens on the ground. That's what creates the energy for democratic politics to work. Ronajoy, if I could ask you to intervene here. Uh, now, parliamentary committees are very important, right? I mean, they kind of give direction to the executive. In the US, some of the some committees are hugely important. They control the money, the budget, everything. Uh, how how are Indian parliamentary committees functioning, uh, especially on security issues? Let's say. Yeah, you know, I think much of our public perception of parliament is through you know what we see in terms of disruptions, the the you know the rowdyism on the floor of the house, you know, rushing to the well, etc. Um, but the parliamentary committees, uh, you know, behind, you know, sort of the closed walls, of course, these, the hearings are not public, we only preview to their reports, uh, have been doing, I would say, fairly good work. Um, so, you know, the parliamentary committee system, in fact, goes back, you know, in India to, uh, to, the, to the British era. So, you know, the Public Accounts Committee, or the PAC, was one of the first to have been set up. It was, I think, in 1919, under the aegis of the uh, Montagu Kelmsford reforms. Uh, and initially, in the early years of parliament, we had standing committees, but there were only these three f financial committees that were there. Uh, it was only in the 90s, uh, and you know, the early 90s, associated with a lot of 
you know, major uh, upheavals in Indian politics, you know, Babri Masjid, the Mandal Commission, uh, of course, uh, the liberalization era. But one thing we tend to forget is that the committee system was actually greatly expanded under Prime Minister Narasimha Rao in 1993. So uh, earlier, before that, they had sort of three department-related committees uh, on an experimental basis that sort of uh, increased, if I'm not wrong, around 18. Uh, so I think the committees have been doing good work. Um, but you know, one of the things that characterized committees was partisanship, uh, bipartisanship, sorry. That I think has uh, uh, has taken a hit, I would say, over the last uh, you know eight to ten years. Uh, and in fact, we see you know parliamentary committee meetings, which are also being sort of um, being held hostage to to some of the things you know the, the the sort of politics that you know occur in in parliament itself. So that I think is a worrying sign. There are other uh, issues with the committees, you know, including you know conflict of interest, which is not very clearly defined. In, in, in the Indian case, whereas in other uh, democracies in the UK, Canada, the US, I think that's um, uh, quite clearly defined. So for instance, you know, on a committee that looks at, um, say, aviation issues, you shouldn't be having someone who is involved in running an airlines. And in India, that's quite common. You know, and, and I can you know, give numerous examples. So for example, for a committee that's examining, say, the impact of uh, tobacco cultivation, etc., you actually have owners of you know, say a, a beery factory, uh, so etc. So these these kind of issues are also rampant. But I think the the the, the breakdown in the sort of consensual relations in the community, I think that is 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 a very very worrying sign. Um, one question that fascinates me is uh, that the south uh, southern states in India are about to lose uh, uh, about twenty seats, I believe, uh, in the delimitation process. So because they have performed well in terms of you know curbing population, and the North is going to gain seats uh, because the population is expanding. How do you square? Uh, you know, how do you uh, understand this process, uh, Yamini? That's a really important question. But can I be, uh, uh, beg your indulgence for two minutes just to respond to to, to something that both uh, speakers earlier have said? Um, I, you know, there's absolutely no argument that uh, our institutions uh, of democracy uh, that in some ways uh, uh, had proven to be a little bit more resilient have come crumbling down uh, in the face of uh, a particular kind of political uh, culture that is prevailing. Uh, but at the heart of that lies, I think, uh, this bigger question of the fact that political elites actually failed to fundamentally inculcate uh, democratic culture in the way in which they saw their role as representatives of uh, the aspirations of people. And in the absence of a democratic culture that recognizes the value of critique, the value of constructive argumentation, and the value of process, no kind of institution will be able to survive uh, what is inevitably access to state power inevitably corrupts. The whole purpose of these institutions was checks and balances. Um, and it is the failure of uh, the Indian elite uh, and their own value systems to actually build precisely those values into the everyday functioning of these institutions. And if you break it down, you'll see it's everything. It goes from the who, how they are staffed, who they are staffed with, what are the processes of ensuring that you have a transparent, a genuinely transparent selection mechanism. All of these are elements that keep finding their way into the public discourse, but it's fundamentally about norms and values, which we fail to incorporate in these institutions. And it is for that reason, I think, that you see this big bridge of trust between what people want of democracy and what our institutions are willing to do, uh, which is at the heart of the challenge that India faces today. And it goes back, I think, to your question about the South and the North. Uh, and it's not just about political representation. It cuts across the entire arc of our social, political, and economic life. The biggest fault line that India is confronting already rests in the fact that our economic 
uh, uh, trajectory moved in a way where it defied everything. India tends to defy uh, all pathways, whether they are democratic or otherwise. There was an expectation that growth would eventually lead to convergence. In fact, growth has led to complete divergence. And we are at a place now where the tra growth trajectories of certain parts of the country are so far away from growth trajectories of other parts of the country that that convergence is quite unlikely. This is unprecedented. So how we deal with it also has to be unprecedented. And what it requires are deep, strong institutions with embedded democratic culture that are able to function and navigate this. What would that be? One very simple thing. The upper house was meant to be a space for representation of state interest. In fact, the upper house has become the space for placing individuals who are uh, necessary perhaps to the technocratic art of policy making, but not, but not necessarily sufficient for representing democratic needs of people. So we, have, we don't at this point in time have the institutions to mediate these fault lines. They are not just coming, they are upon us. Uh, and we don't have, we have an interstate council that is constitutionally mandated that rests moribund. And as a people, it is our responsibility now to really raise uh, the alarm bells for the urgency of these institutions to function. But for all of this, we first need a census that will genuinely tell us what's happening in the country. So fixing our statistical system and doing the basic function of what institutions and democracy is supposed to do, which is things like the, the census, will take us a long way. So let's make those demands. I just wanted to add a footnote to what Yamini's just said, and uh, sorry, this sounds like a litany of disasters, but it needs to be said because we've all referred to free and fair elections, and having studied elections so closely for 20 years, I should note that when you know, we published our book, Why India Votes, for instance, which showed the enthusiasm for elections, elections in India were a very different game. Now. There are three major distortions of Indian elections, which we all must think about, and we do not think about it enough. Number one, the Election Commission of India, which was a non-partisan, impeachable body. It had, a, it had a reputation. Everybody thought it was the best public institution, has failed to remain impartial. Number two, campaign expenditure, which always has been a problem in India. There's lots of cash flowing through the system in elections we do unaccountable, uh, has been legitimately made opaque through electoral bonds. The figures came out just yesterday where 57% of electoral bonds money went to the BJP. Um, and, and therefore, there's a distortion of people who give to opposition parties are then the subject of tax rates and enforcement directorate uh, uh, visits and so on, uh, causing a share loss in their share values. I mean, the disaster of funding any opposition party is major. So electoral bonds is the second thing. And the third thing, which affects each one of us who is an Indian citizen, is that you can now count the results according to polling booth by polling booth. So a polling booth covers a thousand voters. You can tell from every polling booth, every thousand population, who, which parties they're voting for, and therefore their sticks and carrots. As a result, the secret ballot is history. And if people, and one of the major reasons for enthusiasm for elections, as our study showed in the past, was precisely that it was secret, that secrecy has been severely compromised, and we really should be very worried about it, because it's a direct impact on the quality of democracy in India. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but don't you think democracy as a system inevitably leads to all these problems, would lead to all these problems, right? Uh, because political parties, in order to gain influence, will use money, power, whatever have you, you know, at their disposal. We could say that the Congress party had, uh, was in power for a long time, could have done better, could have uh, strengthened institutions, or could have cleaned up the system, but didn't. Now, BJP is in power, they are using, you know, their power to, I don't know if I want to use undermine, but yeah, electoral bonds is a 
huge issue and is frightening. In the US, uh, also uh, the same thing is a problem. Money through the political system is enormous and there's no regulation. Nobody, neither party, neither the Democrats nor the Republicans want to regulate that. <laughs> okay, uh, we're getting a signal that we should uh, open it up for questions. So please raise your hand. Um, okay, uh, the lady in the front. Uh, please wait for the microphone, I think. Um, in the second row, please. It's been recorded, so. No, just please wait for the microphone. And keep your questions short, please, so that more people can have a chance. Chair Chair, uh, thank you for the opportunity and the interesting conversation which has taken place. I'll be very brief. The first is democracy is now not how it looks or what the processes are, but how it feels. Now that's where I want to ask Mukulika Ji that she's not in India, she's seen from abroad. But to a person who's been living here for so many years, the palpable vision of how it feels to be in democratic India is somehow missing and nobody's touched on that. Or the element of fear. Uh, I'm an ex-bureaucrat, so I'm a little worried, but parliamentary committees, I've gone through enough of them. Nobody reads the reports eventually, what happens after the deliberations. So we need some more, you know, heartfelt observations on what has actually transpired on the stage. Thank you. Okay, we'll take a couple of questions more and then, um, okay, uh, the gentleman in the third row, please. I would like to ask a question who is rarely spoken about Indian democracy. It's about the criminalization of the politics. And it was a remark by the ambassador of Singapore a few months ago about how a democracy can work with more than half the MP who are criminals in the national representation of India. Mukulika, would you like to go for... Uh, no, let's just say we don't have time. Okay, so I'll take uh, the first question. Um, we are here as analysts. You know, we, I think we can do a different discourse of what it feels like. Yes, I live abroad. I do a lot of research. I probably spend more time in rural India than most people who are in the audience. So I have a, everything I say is inductive. It comes from ground experience. And one can see what is happening. And yes, I think what we are saying here in an analytical uh, observational language is describing the conditions that create what you're feeling what I'm feeling, what Yamini is feeling, what people here are feeling. When you have a press that does not ask questions of elected representatives, when asking questions by citizens can um, throw them into jail, when there is a culture of fear and censorship, when as academics, my colleagues suffer the complete loss of academic freedom in universities, you can't teach. Universities is one place where you're meant to debate and discuss and ask uncomfortable questions and it's no, no longer possible. Students get beaten up, as we know. So of course that creates a culture. So really what we are describing here is, is why is it that Indian democracy has had the career and what is happening at the moment. We're trying to explain that through uh, uh, analytical language. Uh, Yamini, would you like to answer the second question about criminalization of uh, politics? Sure, and uh, let me for a split second take off my analyst hat uh, and speak as a citizen. Uh, I come from Delhi. We recently had to vote for our municipal elections. 
Uh, and every time as a voter, I stand in that line uh, waiting to vote, uh, it, it, there's a sense of thrill and excitement, uh, even though when I walk into the elect, to, the, to, the, to, to press the button, I'm thoroughly confused about what I should do uh, because uh, of many of the issues that have, we have raised and, and this, this whole question of criminalization, I'm not always sure that those who seek to represent me uh, in effect actually do represent me as a voter, as a citizen, my anxieties, my demands, my needs. But there is a thrill and excitement and a sense of deep power. And the whole point of talking about democracy, studying democracy, being a participant in democracy is to ensure that we continue to feel that sense of thrill and deep power. There is nothing like being able to vote, uh, even if those who you're voting for, you know, come with warts and everything. So that's what we should preserve and fight for. And those are the spaces of critique, engagement, dialogue that we need to preserve and fight for, despite all that we know is wrong with our democracy. Ronija, you want to say yeah, something? I, I just wanted to add to, uh, to that question on criminalization. And in fact, uh, what had happened was that in the Singapore uh, parliament, it was just the numbers, which are actually you know, true, was mentioned that you know, uh, in the current parliament, over 40% of the MPs have criminal charges. Mind you, these are not they have not been convicted, you know, it's criminal charges, so there's a difference. But but the, the, the government sort of reacted, uh, you know, adverse to that comment, which is merely boldly stating the stating the facts. Uh, but just a quick note there also, um, you know, um, some research has shown that, you know, voters are not apparently averse to, you know, voting for people uh, uh, with criminal records. And, you know, maybe some of them see that as a sort of, you know, some kind of a badge of efficiency, etc. So there is, you know, more research that needs to be done on why, you know, certain kinds of people do get elected, even people with criminal records and some of them with very senior, serious criminal charges. It's not just not sort of organizing a procession on the street, etc. You know, uh, serious criminal charges like rape, murder, manslaughter, etc. So I think, you know, more work needs to be done on that. Uh, anybody else? Okay. Uh... The gentleman in the front row. My question is to you, sir. You said that we don't have enough Muslim representatives in parliament. Can you kindly explain if I'm a Hindu uh, representative, please explain how I'm not able to address the issues of Muslims in particular, albeit education, be it good roads, be it sanitization, be it well-being of a Muslim, rather than being a Muslim representative, which I think might be saying, uh, issuing the problem of the religious issues. See, I am a Jain myself, right? I might be the mi smallest minority in this country. I don't need to have a Jain representative in parliament for my problems as a nation of this country. Thank you. Who wants to tackle that? Do you want to make sure? Two? You know, uh, you, know um, you have a point there, but minorities representation in parliament, you know, I think that's, uh, you know, to address the interests. So, so for instance, in the Indian parliament, you know, uh, Christians, the other smaller minorities, I'm not sure about the Jains, but Christians and Sikhs, yeah, so Christians and Sikhs have, you know, uh, uh, representatives according to their own you know, whatever the population is in. in. But for Muslims, the, the gap is extremely stark, and that's what I was pointing to. So if the Muslim population roughly, of course, we don't have the latest census figures, roughly around 15% 15, 15 of the population, uh, you have only, you know, I think 4.5% of, of uh, parliament uh, is, is uh, Muslim MPs. And and just to add, the, 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 the ruling party does not have a single Muslim MP. So that's something to ponder about. You know, there's one MP by the name of Somitra Khan in Bengal, but I think that he's apparently also not a Muslim. You know, that's the sort of title. So we don't have a, you know, the, the ruling party does not have a single, out of its, you know, whatever, you know, 300 odd MPs, not a single uh, Muslim MP. I don't know whether- uh, I think Yamini wants, wants to ask. say a few words. Same question should be asked about why we want a women's reservation bill, why we think about caste representation in parliament. Ultimately, <laughs> so I, 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 I don't think that's the point. Parliament is supposed to represent the diversity of this country, 
all voices, all castes, all religion, all genders, and all should have an equal voice in positions of power. That's the point. Um, we have time for maybe one question. Um, the gentleman in the second row here. Uh, each, of, each of you have spoken about um, some of the strains under which Indian democracy uh, is operating at the moment, but I haven't heard the name of Prime Minister Modi, so I wonder if, if one of you could offer a reflection on the kinds of strains that some of his policies and practices are placing on Indian democracy, particularly his Hindu nationalist drive. And secondly, to connect that to India's image in the eyes of the world, I mean, I need hardly point out the way in which so many are holding up India as the democratic bulwark, the great counterweight to communist China, and yet many, because of Mr Modi's policies, are having to shake the Indian hand but sometimes look the other way because of the strains under which Indian democracy is operating. I'm happy to take that. Um, thank you for asking that question. It's, it's entirely right, you're right, that uh, saying you're a democracy is not enough. Uh, you've got to be a democracy. And, and what I said about elections, for instance, has really happened under Prime Minister Modi's tenure. Uh, um, the secrecy of the ballot. We have a machine that can mix uh, the ballots before we count them, so you can't break it down to 1,000 population. That has been stopped by the BJP, but also other political parties. But given they're in the majority in parliament, they could have uh, introduced it. Uh, so there are institutional distortions that have come in in the last nine years, that, without doubt. Um, but also at a broader level, you know, there's a self-avowed commitment to an ideology of Hindutva, which is not a secret. It's not being brought into the back door. This is the official ideology of the ruling party. It is the official ideology of the RSS. And that is precisely an idea of India, which is, according to the current Indian constitution, would be unconstitutional. A Hindu nation is not what is written in the Indian constitution. So if your imagination of India is one of Hindutva, then it is unconstitutional. And it is unconstitutional in a way that it is undemocratic because it is not, um, it is not necessarily the will of the people, but one that you uh, will by power. The interesting space internationally is precisely, as you say, that the world needs a democratic ally. And therefore, it is easier to overlook these things as long as we are able to welcome everybody uh, to the G20 and have posters. I was in Meghalaya last week and there were posters absolutely everywhere. So you know, there is a, uh, there's a messaging that goes out about India being a democracy and being the mother of all democracies and so on, which as I think all of us who observe the way that Prime Minister Modi and his government run the country, messaging is key saying the right thing is very important. The reality may be very different from that message, but I think it suits a lot of the global powers, especially in, in Quad and others, to look simply look the other way. And uh, I don't expect Western critique of Indian democracy to rectify. I think that is the job of Indians themselves. Just, just, I know we're almost out of time, so I'll just say one thing. I think this is where this electoral democracy versus substantive democracy becomes so key because electoral democracy does, in India and across the globe, often throw up a non-representative, uh, non-democratic form of government, and that's where substantive democracy comes in. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all my panelists and thank you to the audience for your wonderful questions. Thank you. We would like to thank again Rana John Sen, Yamani Ayer, Mukulika Banerjee and Seema Suroi for this interesting conversation. Thank you so much. De, de, de.